agree with you. All right. Hey, welcome to the fourth episode of Converse Cousins with Mike and Mark. I am your co-host, Mike Salzman, and with me as always is my cousin, Mark Alton. A big Toronto Raptors fan. <laughs> no, that's not true. Go Kings. Yeah, I'm saying he's wearing a Kings shirt. No one's buying that. I'm, yeah. Um, as, a, as a Warrior fan, uh, a Kings fan, we are both California bred, so that's that's what we're doing. And uh, and you are much luckier than I this time of year. This time of year. In well, the last years. few years, yeah. Kings Kings were very good for a while while the Warriors weren't. Yeah. Um, so we'll be discussing new topics every couple of weeks. Um, we're together today for the fourth episode of the series of How to Fix Your Favorite Sport. So this time we're talk about Warriors and Kings, we are doing the NBA, so the National Basketball Association. We've done, we've covered the NFL, we've covered college basketball and Major League Baseball, so if you want to check those out on our YouTube channel, you can find out all the ways we fixed your favorite sport in those. All of those leagues have already adopted all of our suggestions. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, that's that's kind of the main, the main point here, is that ultimately we expect every one of these changes to be enforced immediately, and so we're actually really proud of the strides we've made in those sports. Yeah, 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 they're much better now. Especially the NFL, which has not yet done anything uh, on the field since we last chatted. Anyway. Yeah, the, the rules changes have been made. Mm, good, and, okay. And we, we were told right. that yeah. they were made. Um, so let's just jump right into it. The first one we're going to get out of the way because it's you know, we both agree with it completely, and I think you will too, and that's we need to change the playoffs from eight teams in both conferences to just the top 16. Um, I think when you have that many teams making the playoffs, it's pretty easy to – justify the 15th and 16th best teams having a uh, more deserving uh, road to the playoffs than the eighth seed in a conference that's much weaker. Um, if you look at it this year, the Kings and Lakers would have made the playoffs instead of the it was Orlando and Detroit. And I don't think there's a single NBA fan watching any games this year that really thinks that Detroit and Orlando are better than uh, the Lakers or the Kings. And the Lakers and the Kings games the last few weeks would have been a lot more competitive had they had a, a realistic shot at the playoffs too. So it would have helped those teams compete and would have made the East have to work a lot harder to, to get those teams to get in the playoffs too. So I think all things considered, it's the, it's the best way to get the best 16 teams to play. And it makes the, it would make the one versus 16 a better game because it's a better team. My only modification is that they take the top 14 plus the Kings and Warriors. <laughs> is that good? Like every year, no matter what. Yeah, just even if they're 0-82. I'm okay with that. I'm not sure if everyone else would be. Okay. Um, at least at the moment, it would seem like the Warriors and Kings being automatic uh, bids would be safe for next year because they both look like they'd be pretty pretty good. The Kings' uh, youth is only getting better. So. True. All right, so um, why don't you take the next one since that one was pretty simple. Okay. Uh, the complicated one we have is the issue of the referees. Uh <laughs> So we touched on this a little bit in our college basketball podcast, which I'm sure you all watched. Right. Um, Two or three times. Yeah, I mean, I've had it on in the car every day. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, so, I mean, you know, I, I think in that podcast I said something like, uh, you know, the referees are the reason why basketball is not great uh, for me to watch. The only reason, really. Um, so that might be overstating it a little bit, but... In the NBA, we have players complaining all the time. We have block and charge calls that are unclear. So do you want to start by talking about those? Well, I think, too, you know, one one thing that the NBA did that I think helped was having the restricted area, you know, give them a visual of what at least one of the problems with block and charge is where a guy's coming from and where they are. One of the things that's always going to be hard in the NBA, even more so than college basketball, is just how – fast guys are how quickly guys can get to a spot how quickly they can get set and so even if a guy jumps in front of another guy technically he you know he can create a charge because he got there you know and at the same time you know there was a uh, a block charge call um, in the game in game two where demarcus cousins got called for charging against kyle lowry and if you watch from cousins perspective he does essentially a spin move into kyle lowry and doesn't, didn't really have any chance to see him there mm -hmm. because Kyle Lowry wasn't when, when he was had his back to the, the – And DeMarcus mm -hmm. is like eight feet tall. Right, especially compared to Kyle Lowry. And so you could make the case, well, you know, that's not fair. He wasn't you – know, he, you know, he, didn't, he didn't see him, so how would he be able you – know, and it's like, okay, but at the same time, Lowry did get there, and when you make a spin move, that's maybe one of the risks of, of doing that is that you end up losing sight of what's in front of you. And I think ultimately that's one of the harder ones. Like when you get mad at referees for getting that call wrong, it's like, 
there's a reason those calls get wrong sometimes. But I also think that, you know, and just this is more a general NBA rule is that, you know, superstars tend to get the advantage, right? You know, if uh, one of the things I've to use the same series, you know, in these, in these finals, Alfonso McKinney is, you know, a very unknown player outside of Warrior circles. And unless people have been watching the playoffs, have no idea who he is. Whenever he's been guarding Kawhi Leonard in this series, he's gotten called for fouls pretty mm-hmm. pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. And not to say that he wasn't fouling Kawhi Leonard because he was trying to be physical with him defensively, but it's so much quicker for a whistle to be blown when it's a guy like McKinney guarding a superstar like Kawhi. You, you would and think that, that. And that kind of stuff is the kind of things that I really wish would get kind of be removed from, from the league because maybe the referees can undergo some sort of training like, like, you know, like, hey, just favor the underdog player for a while. <laughs> well, and, the, you know, you know, I with only the, with there only being allowed six fouls, like, you know, in the in the NFL, you could have 15 holding penalties on you. And if, it, if your coach keeps you in the game, you could have a 16th. But there's no mm-hmm. there's no um, you, there's no limit to the number of fouls you're allowed to commit if you're a player unless a uh, coach decides they don't want you in the game. Maybe anymore. superstars should only be allowed five fouls. How about that? <laughs> But, you know, I think there is something to the fact that, you know, this is entertainment. And if you were to call fouls right down the middle, then you might end up losing some of your superstar players by the third or fourth quarter because they foul too much. Mm-hmm. That also then on the flip side would be, well, tell your superstars to stop fouling so much, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also think that what happens is a lot of these ticky-tack fouls go against the, you know, the, the lesser players. And it ends up slowing the game down. It ends up creating a bunch of free throws when that's one of the least exciting things about the NBA. I mean, one of the only times a free throw is exciting is if your team is down one and you've got and your guy's going for two free throws. And then there's this, you know, this sweating moment of like, can he make them both or whatever? That, that can be that can be exciting. Yeah. I still would rather see a set play and someone trying to get open for a jumper to win the game. And, yeah. You know have that kind of a walk-off moment in the NBA. Yeah, I mean, I think for me it's, it's uh, you know, I, if I turn the game on and I see DeMarcus Cousins complaining to the referees, it, it just reduces, I mean, it, it this happened to me for years watching the right. Kings. It just reduces my, my interest in it and to the, to, the, uh, to the kids or to the common fan. It's just, it's, it's not a good look for the NBA. Yeah. So I was thinking, well, maybe we, we just – ban all players from ever talking to a referee. If you say anything to a referee, it's immediately a technical foul. But then that removes, I, I don't know if the referees would even prefer that. It kind of removes the human element completely. So then I was thinking, okay, well, maybe we do remove the human element completely and with all the technology that we have available, uh, maybe we simplify things and just have, uh, after a certain amount of contact that's made by some sort of objective assessment by technology, like force equals mass times acceleration over a certain threshold, bam, automatic foul, the horn goes off in the arena. I don't think we're there yet with the technology uh, and the nuance of these block charge kind of thing to really have that uh, ability at this point. But you had one idea about um, initiating contact that I thought was pretty good. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, you, you can call it the James Harden rule or whatever you want, but, you know, it, in, in, in you know, keep going back to the finals since it's going right now, but so in game two they actually they didn't stop play, but there was a there were free throws happening. You know, Steph Curry was at the foul line, and they bring in their their referee expert um, to talk about him. You know, kind of throwing his body into the defender, and that should it be a foul on on Steph Curry instead of instead of the defender. Yeah, and I, I found it ironic because I don't remember them really doing that much in the Rocket series mm-hmm. when James mm-hmm. Harden would do it, you know, mm-hmm. more more regularly. Mm-hmm. And Steph absolutely was hunting for a foul there. And part of it's because it's been enabled by mm-hmm. all these guys getting that call. Yeah. You know, that if you, you know, pump fake and a guy goes up in the air and then you throw your body mm-hmm. into them, they'll call a foul on the defender. And to me, if you make that an offensive foul, because the, in, the initiator of the contact was actually the offensive player going into the defender, mm-hmm. then that kind of play doesn't happen anywhere near as much anymore. And, you know, does Steph Curry deserve three free throws when a guy jumps up in the air and then he throws his shoulder into him? Not necessarily, but he deserves it based on the rules right now. Yeah. And that's where I think a rule change is, is it could be put in place. And, you know, one of the things we didn't go, I don't know if we went into a great deal about this on the baseball podcast, but 
I think I think we mentioned this. We were t- I remember we talked about Christy Matheson quite a bit. So I know we were going. I know we were going way back. But mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. one of the reasons that baseball rules were always well, it's, up, it's umpire discretion. It's umpire discretion was because there was no TV, there was no radio, right. there was no way other than a ref than a re- the referee being allowed to kind of make a judgment. Yeah. Otherwise, there wasn't going to be a way to verify whether something happened or didn't happen. So umpires were given that kind of carte blanche to be like you decide yeah. you decide if it's a check swing you decide whatever so if the rule change if there was a rule change to whoever initiates contact that's the who the fouls on mm-hmm. then it's easier then for nba refs going forward to mm-hmm. make the call now they might get some wrong because they don't see the offensive player throw their shoulder into a guy yeah. and they only see the defender making contact but then the then the offensive player says or the defensive player will go up to him after the the foul call and be like, hey, actually, he threw his shoulder into me. Watch for that next time. But then the next time that happens, they they have the the rationale mm-hmm. because of the rule change to call the offensive foul there. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's where the game can clean up a little bit. Mm-hmm. Because if if a James Harden or a Russell Westbrook or Steph Curry or whoever is allowed to throw their body into someone and the call goes against the guy who's been, who's been thrown into, then what, what are we really doing? Because that's pretty ugly basketball. That's not yeah. Steph Curry or Harden yeah. or Westbrook or, Kraft, or whoever the, trying to, to make a basket. And it's that's him not trying what, to go to the free throw line. What casual fans want to see. It's not, right. not what people leaning into each other and trying to trick the referees and stuff like that. I mean, I, we, we're treating this as sort of reactive. I think you know James Harden's been doing this a lot. Uh, people were reacting, and he, and he didn't invent this. He's just right. He's it, just been really good at kind of perfecting it because yeah, he knows yeah. it's. A, I mean, the easiest shot in the NBA is a layup. The second easiest shot is a free throw, and the third easiest shot would be like a wide open shot from kind of anywhere, depending mm-hmm. on your range, right? Mm-hmm. But you know, layups and threes and free throws are what basketball has become. Mm-hmm. That very mm-hmm. few mid range jumpers, very few you know low post moves anymore. It's can we get layups? Can we get free throws? Can we get three pointers? Yeah, and yeah. if you're open for all those, and obviously you're open for free throws, um, you know you're more than likely to make them. And it's become a numbers game where it's like when you crunch the numbers, it makes way more sense for a guy who's an okay three point shooter to shoot a wide open three mm-hmm. than it is for a Steph Curry to shoot a contested three. Mm-hmm. And you know Steph Curry likes to prove that sometimes that's not true, mm-hmm. <laughs> but for the most part that is true. Mm-hmm. And you know, if guys are always shooting wide open shots, they're always getting to the foul line, and they're always finding ways to, to find guys for layups, then they're going to make their shots more than they're not. Yeah. And if a team's shooting better than 50%, you know, between free throws and, and their jumpers and layups, then that's going to lead to a lot of wins. Yeah. And teams like the Rockets have proven that. Do you, uh, this wasn't on our initial list, but we could touch on it briefly. Do you have any uh, thoughts on, um, should we like, move the three-point line back, try to reduce this emphasis on threes that has, has sort of ballooned in the last 10 years, or should we just let it happen? I, th- I think, well, a couple things. I think it's considering how much the NBA makes collectively with, between the teams specifically about courtside seats, <laughs> I don't see the three-point line changing at all on the sides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one thing I could see is actually taking away the three-point line from the, in the corner Mm-hmm. Like maybe that would be one way to kind of you know mm-hmm. end some of this yeah. is that you actually just make that a two, yeah, and you actually take a, like so the three point line would maybe start um, you know at the elbow or something right. you know and yeah. that you actually lose you know, I haven't I never thought about this until you just said that but maybe something like that could change because that corner three is such an easy shot for so many guys yeah that if it's only worth two then that changes some of the dynamics there yeah. and it puts more emphasis on shooting uh, uh, two-point shots there. Um, it, I don't know if that would actually make it worse because then guys would just not be in the corner as much. Mm-hmm. And so, therefore, there would be, there'd be more, even more guys away from the corner and having to shoot from further away. Um, mm. I don't know if a four-point shot makes sense or, <laughs> or, like, or, or making the, the shot further away because guys are literally shooting. I mean, shooting is one of the easiest things a guy can do in the offseason, right? Mm-hmm. There's not a from from my history with the NBA of the last 30 years, you know I've been watching since I was seven or eight years old. Is almost every superstar got better as a shooter, mm-hmm. you know whether it was Jordan or Karl Malone or you know I mean 
you know, David Robinson, Patrick Ewing, you know, all these Charles Barkley, every one of those guys got much better as shooters. Yeah. As they got older. Yeah. And it's because as you get older, you don't have the athleticism to do a lot of the other stuff you used to do, right. but you can always work on your jumper. Yeah. And you don't need a teammate. You don't need. You don't even need anyone else. You can just go get the rebound yourself. But I mean, guys can shoot all the time, right? So if you move the lines, guys are just going to work on that more. Yeah. So I don't know if it would even necessarily change that much. Yeah. Um, obviously, the closer a three-point line is to the hoop, the easier it's going to be in general for the majority of guys to do well. Yeah. But it's not like I mean, you you move the line, it's still going to be Steph Curry still shooting from way beyond the line. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, someone like Clay Thompson, who's kind of perfected shooting right behind the line from everywhere, you know, maybe it would affect him a little bit more than it would someone like Curry. Um, but, you know, James Harden, Damian Lillard, you know, these guys are all shooting from f- way further away yeah. because they know the spacing wise, it's actually smarter that if you can get good at those shots, it's actually easier to get open looks mm. from 28 feet than it is from 23 feet. Yeah. And I, I don't see the problem with that from a fan perspective. I mean, I think. You know, we've moved from a league that was uh, in, what, the 60s and 70s. It was a Wilt Chamberlain, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, hey, I'm taller than you. I can shoot over you. Right. I'm going to dominate kind of league to now one where guys are standing back. The the, the tall centers, you know, the, they're sort of at an all-time low in terms of their influence on, on uh, you know, how valuable they are and, and, and all that. So I, I don't I don't see a, a rule change that we're proposing at this point. Um but it's sort of like with baseball and strikeout totals going up. We see it happening. We see these three-point uh, attempt uh, averages going way up. Um, we'll, we'll just let it happen for now, I guess. Well, you know, and you, you look at like, so when, when quarter, because, you know, when, when the NFL started, you know, everyone ran the ball. And then all of a sudden, after a generation of guys just running the ball, then they started the forward pass, yeah. and all of a sudden quarterbacks became a thing. And then you know Johnny Unitas became a legendary quarterback. And then over the generations, now it's just become a passing game. You know, running, mm-hmm. getting a running back in the first round of a draft is, seems ridiculous. You're gonna, get, you're, you know, you go out and you, you can find, try to find a quarterback. But if you don't get a quarterback, you get a left tackle, or you get a defensive end, or you get a cornerback because you want. Yeah. The guy who's protecting the quarterback, the guy who can go get the quarterback, or the guy who can pick off the quarterback, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like the positions that became the most valuable came from what the number one position was, which was quarterback, yeah. right? It used to be running back, which meant linebackers mattered more, or you know, defensive linemen mattered more. But now that it's quarterback, and it's been that way for generations, it's the defensive end, it's the you know, it's a cornerback on defense, and it's a left tackle on offense, right? So. These games kind of change and morph a little bit naturally. All right. The time. So when you look at if you look at the Best players in the NBA right now. Giannis is one of the only guys of that group that doesn't really shoot that well. But he's a complete freak of nature with his size and athleticism. Mm -hmm. But you look at some of these other guys who are going to be, you know, who are all NBA guys, whether it's Kemba Walker, Dane Lillard, Steph Curry, you know, they aren't huge. Mm -hmm. They're taller than the average, you know, guy out there. But they're not tall, you know, especially compared to NBA legends and those kind of things. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, someone like an Isaiah Thomas was a rare thing. Chris Paul is a rare thing for guys that small to be dominant. Mm-hmm. Um, but now, when, whether it's Trey Young or some of these other young guys that are coming in the league, you know, size matters for defense no matter what because when you have a guy like Steph Curry who's changing the game, a guy like Kawhi Leonard or Danny Green are better defenders against it, Steph Curry than someone his size. Mm-hmm. So going after other guys, Steph Curry's size is only good if they're amazing offensively. Mm-hmm. But defensively, you want to have that length. So mm-hmm. well, I think what's happening is, is that the most important position is no longer center. It's, it's a, someone who can shoot. And if it's a point guard who can shoot, that's even better. Because, you know, back in the day when it was a you know, pass first point guard, you were actually, it was actually silly to ask the guy who had the ball the most not know how to shoot. Right, right, right. The Mark Jacksons, the Jason well, Kidd's. Probably you know. developed that way because, again, you were feeding it into the gigantic guy in the center. Well, like, right. So you needed a guy who knew how to do that and could yeah. and wouldn't lose the ball and would you know and then would get it to him so he can get the easy basket. Right. Yeah. So there was a reason for it. Right. Now that's changed. Now you want your point guard to be able to score. You want your be able to, your point guard to be able to score off the dribble. Which means if you can't get a Steph Curry, then you need to find your Andre Iguodala. You need to find your, you know, Danny Green or whoever, whatever strong defender you might have. 
But, you know, the Marcus Smarts out there, the Eric Bledsoe's, one of the reasons they're valuable and they was because, you know, Patrick Beverly was because they can limit what some of those offensive threats can do. Yeah. And yeah. so that becomes then more important than having a rim protector center yeah. because you're not going to have guys going at the rim all the time, yeah. whether it's a point guard or a center or, or in, in between. Yeah. And so as the game has changed, the values have changed. And so now it's perimeter shooters and perimeter defenders are the most important. And when you have a Draymond Green or an Andre Godala who are versatile enough defensively to handle multiple positions, then when you play pick and roll and you play different things, you have guys that can can handle both situations. Mm-hmm. And that becomes more valuable. So it, I'm okay it, with it. I'm okay with this this particular future direction of the NBA. Not all future directions, but this well, and particular. Th- and, and I think people have said this from the beginning, as soon as Steph Curry be, you know, was at Davidson and, and was exciting to watch, is that you know, whether it's the baby-faced assassin version of the fact that he just looks like a young kid um, or just the fact that he's a smaller, thinner guy yeah. and he's only 6'3", um, which is way taller than me at 5'6", but it's, you know, 6'3", is not a behemoth the way it, someone like, you know, a Sean Kemp was back in the day or, you know, some, you know, or Shaquille O'Neal or, or anyone else like that, is that you see him and you're like, oh, I could become him one day. Because he looks yeah. like me, right? And there is something to that. I think when you see every when every pitcher in baseball is six foot five, there's a limit to what you can do if you're in the if you're in the little league and you're you're pitching and you're and you know you're not going to become that tall, then you might not continue pitching. You know, whereas if there was some, you know, if Tim when Tim Lincecum came around, it was like, oh, he looks like me. I could if he could pitch, maybe I could pitch. Yeah. And so I think there is something to that with uh, Damian Lillard and Kemba Walker and. and Chris Paul and Steph Curry being some of the best point guards in yeah. the league. Too bad Isaiah Thomas has gone a little bit downhill because he was fun to watch. Right. When I, yeah, when I mentioned Isaiah Thomas earlier, I was talking about the Pistons one, but yeah, yeah Isaiah Thomas from the Kings oh, and there you go. the Kings and Celtics. Yeah, is, you know, absolutely. And, um, it was certainly a, a, he was cool. a, a extreme example of that. Yeah. You know, along the lines of a Nate Robinson or mm-hmm. Muggsy Bogues, Spud Webb. Should we, uh, should we go on to the next one? Yeah, let's do it. All right. You want to go or should I? Um, we'll see. I mean, we kind of we already touched on on technicals and everything, but, but um, well, not I mean, technicals, but like you know, getting Referees. guys getting guys to stop yelling at the refs. Well, but you yeah. know, the the main one that I know you want to talk about um, that we've done for every show is the, is tanking and kind of mm-hmm. some ways to fix that. So yeah, and I also have a brilliant idea for the problem of teams uh, taking too many timeouts at the end of games and games slowing down. So do you down. want to do the, let's do, let's do the timeouts? No, let's, let's, uh, let's wait. Cause you know, we want, want, to, we want, want a build, teaser. We're, we're building, we're building a suspense. I yeah. haven't even heard this one. So that, that's okay. why he's trying to build it. So let's go to, let's go to tanking. tanking. So yeah. um, we've talked about tanking with, with other sports. The one thing I would say is that what we've kind of been consistent about with this is that, you know, similar to minor league baseball, if you have a second half champion, mm-hmm be guaranteed a, a playoff spot, that that be, uh, would be a way to limit, eliminate tanking from some teams. So you think like just the 15th and 16th spots in the playoffs get saved for the second half champ, or what, what do you think? It, yeah, so the what I would say is, is that the, the team with the best record the second half of the season in the West and the East are guaranteed a playoff spot. Mm-hmm. Now, if they if that happened to be the Bucks and Warriors, mm-hmm. then nothing changes, and you still go with. So, like, let's, yeah. let's, so let's so the the two rule changes I would make is top sixteen teams, regardless of conference, makes the playoffs, and okay. then you just and you literally do a, a college basketball March Madness one through sixteen bracket. So yeah. one one faces sixteen, and when they when and if the, if the one seed wins, they face off against the eight nine. So that would be the playoffs format. Yeah. The other element then would be that the team with the best second half record in the West and the team with the best second half record in the East are guaranteed a playoff spot. So for argument's sake, if that was the Kings and um, the Miami Heat, the two teams that didn't make the playoffs, well, let's say the Miami Heat had the best second half record among everybody and the Kings had the best second half record among everybody, then they get in. And if because their overall record didn't get them in, then they then whoever had the better record between the Kings and the Heat would get the 15 C, the other team would get the 16 C. But so I agree with you, but it feels like in baseball that's going to be a pretty common thing. Where like, you know, that allows a new team to get in, right? The second mm-hmm. half champ is not one of the others. But in basketball, I feel like nine times out of ten, the team with the best record in each conference is going to be one of the best teams in the league the whole year. Right. 
So then maybe we go further with it. Maybe we give the top two or the top three per conference in the second half. I mean, we could even go all the way to four, right? And then have right, like right, right. the best first half and the best second half teams evenly in the playoffs. So maybe, maybe I we also, go I also direction. think that if you, you know, put it this way, with 41 games in the second half. And, and the other thing is that there, we have to determine that it's the second 41 games and not after the All-Star break because the All-Star break mm-hmm. is only 25 games. Right, right. And, or I, think it was, I think it was only 25 games this year. So you could do that, which then would be maybe a little bit more extreme because a team mm-hmm. like the Warriors who's already in, a team mm-hmm. like the Bucks who were already in, yeah. maybe aren't trying to win as yeah. much at the end of the year. So, you know, a, a team would be more likely to have the best record over 25 games to, you know, in the second half of the year. So if, it, if mm-hmm. you actually did it post All-Star break, yeah. that actually could be more likely to be at, at teams that aren't in the top eight at the moment yeah. or top 16 at the moment. Yeah. And that is that is more likely the time when teams give up, too. And right, start exactly. So if you, and so that would be a way of doing that. The other part of it is that if it was 41, like if you actually did it like dire- directly down the middle, mm-hmm. 41 games is a ton of games mm-hmm. still. Right. So to, to your point, you're absolutely right. A team like Denver and a team like you know uh, Toronto may have easily had the best record the second half, and it wouldn't have changed anything. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also think that <coughs> you first of all have to give you know teams a chance that maybe were banged up and injured in the first half mm-hmm. a chance to have success. But I think the other part of it is, is that if you have it be 41 games, then a team that wins 30 of them and goes 30 and 11, let's say that was the best record. Yeah. If they won 30 in the first half, how horrible would they have had to have been in the, in the, or in the, in the second half? How horrible would they have had to have been in the first half to not make the playoffs? True, yeah. So, you know, it, it more than likely, if you did it at the 41 mark, you're not going to, just to your original point, there might not be very many changes because yeah. you have to win some games in the first half yeah. to, you yeah. know, to be – best team in the second half and not make the playoffs. So, I mean, it would be a nice gentle introduction to this idea to just right. have one team from each conference. I, the other the other way to, to look at it would be, so I've always thought that uh, teams should be, so the, the number one pick in the draft should be won and not lost. You know what I mean? Like, there should be some sort of competitive reward for, like, if you win a certain amount of games, if you do certain things, then you are awarded the number one pick in the draft. Yeah. So then... Let's take an example of that. Like, suppose we take this after the All-Star break thing. And what, what was it, 24, 28 games, something like that, after the All-Star break? I, I think it was 25, but 25, I mean, something like that. It's a, it was around there. I'll look it up. I don't really care. Anyway. Well, it's, uh, not, it's, it's irrelevant it's to our point. It's less than 41. Yeah, yeah it's, it so, was irrelevant to our point. But if, I, th- I think um, it was 25. But let's say, let's say you have 25 games. So from that point on, if your team makes the playoffs, they make the playoffs. But if they don't make the playoffs and they have the best record among the teams that don't make the playoffs, then maybe they get the number one pick, something like that. So teams are competing really hard at the end of the year. Even right. though they're not making the playoffs, right. they're going to get the number one pick. That, to me, seems like it, it does, it's not – we're not now stacking the league and giving the best teams the number one pick, but we're also making it competitive and we're making – it interesting for fans. I mean, imagine it comes down to the last day and the Heat yeah. and the Kings are competing right, exactly. for that spot and then, like, the Kings win. It's a celebration. We're going to get Zion Williamson, you know, something like that. Right. That that would be fun for the fans. That would suddenly people be watching that game. I do I do think, though, there's a couple things in play there. One, it would be a little... It had, it'd have to be a little frustrating. Like, so, for example, this, this year's draft was about getting Zion Williamson. So teams like the Knicks were hoping... Or Knicks fans were hoping for the, the worst record, so they had the best chance of getting Zion Williamson. Yeah. If you change it up to where the team with the most wins gets there, the one, one thing that I would find a little hard to stomach is that you're telling a guy, go out there and win for us so that we can replace you with Zion mm. Williamson, <laughs> right? Like, that would, th- th- just that idea to me is, is kind of messed up because, yeah. you know, think about all those bad years in Sacramento, all the bad years I had in, in Golden State. So, you know, I'll pick a, a warrior. Like, so if a Zion Williamson type, you know, let's, and, then, and back then maybe he's a power forward, you know, because they're obviously mm-hmm. the players that could play seven positions, you know, um, even though it was only five, <laughs> you know, didn't necessarily exist. Like you were a three or you were a four or you were a five, right? So let's just say Zion Williamson was a four. That, you know, then, uh, you know, Danny Fortson, on the Warriors, that's a good pull right there. You know, you're telling him he was go out rebounder. there, go out there and help us win so that we can replace you with Zion Williamson, yeah. right? Yeah. 
So that that to me is weird. The other part of it is is that as a fan of the Warriors who saw them lose year after year after year and draft crappy player after crappy player after crappy player, um, to tell that team now, now those last 25 games, your terrible roster, you better win or you're going to get like the 14th pick. Mm-hmm. You're actually going to make it way harder for bad teams to get better. Mm-hmm. And every it's almost every, like we're taking the anti-tanking thing too far. Well, and I th- so I think there is a point to that because I, mm-hmm. you know, the Knicks were terrible, and some of it was very self-inflicted. Mm-hmm. It was bad decision making, you know, going after LeBron, getting getting told no, and then getting Amari Stoudemire was a way way bigger drop off than they were hoping. And some people could see that coming, but not everyone. And obviously they knew LeBron was better than Amari Stoudemire, but it's like when you get Amari Stoudemire and nothing else, Mm -hmm. then you're not going to be very good. And Carmelo Anthony was a a Hall of Fame player, but he didn't help them win. And so some of them, some of that was self-inflicted, but then, you know, you draft a guy like Porzingis and then you don't do a good job working with him and managing him to where he doesn't want to stay there. You've created this toxic environment. Like some of it is their own fault. But being a terrible team, you shouldn't then get punished for being bad at decision making. In the last couple of years, they've hired some new people that seem to know what they're doing. And if they start drafting well, then that things change. But if you don't give them a chance to draft high because their current team is terrible, there there is there is there's a give and take there because yeah, yeah. you know the, the the to me I I still think the worst teams should still have the best chance to get the best players in the draft. Mm. One of the things that the Warriors proved over a very uh, several years is that whether it was taking Joe Smith over a risk like high school phenom Kevin Garnett, <laughs> or whether it was taking the safe pick like Todd... It seems F- like you're holding on to these things. A little bit. Or, but it's, okay, I'm, it's, also, it's also the easiest polls for me mentally <laughs> to give examples of why, the, you know, why... Like, you know, the Clippers were bad forever. Elgin Baylor was a, a Hall of Fame player, top 15 player to ever play the game. Awful GM, mm-hmm. right? right? The Clippers, no matter where they drafted, whether it was Michael Olawakandi or whatever, like, you know, they was the number one pick, did a terrible job. The yeah. Number eight pick, did a terrible job. So, yeah, yeah. you know, and the Warriors were that way too, whether it was Todd Fuller or Adal Foyle, like, they, you know, Ike Diagu, I mean, Patrick O'Brien, I can, I can, I can give you more. Yeah. But Kings have some bad ones in there too. Exactly, and 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 every team does, right? Just because you get the top a top five pick doesn't mean you're going to make the right choice, right? Mm-hmm. But when you when you make bad choices year after year after year, that doesn't necessarily mean you should be punished in the draft lottery to not have a chance at a good pick because you stink again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. now you should learn from your mistakes and hire new people and replace your terrible players with somewhat better players, but. You know that takes time. Yeah. You know, and I think ultimately, what the what the league has done now, where the Knicks had a fourteen percent chance of getting the number one pick, and so three teams, and they changed it from the top three to top four, meaning that the, uh, as many as four teams could change hands, yeah. and then three of them did. This year's draft lottery kind of proved that they f- not fixed tanking, but they made it to where now there is. Proof that being terrible doesn't guarantee you a top five pick, mm-hmm. and when you've now taken a chance at a top five pick away from a, from two teams, because you've had three teams jump, um, you know, in or so it's one team, but you know the other teams are got the fifth and sixth pick instead yeah. of getting a, you know, a top three pick, and even in this draft, it's looked at as like a three or four player draft before it kind of drops off. Um, after the yeah. you know phenom that is Zion, so if you had a chance at a top three pick and now you're picking fifth or sixth, that's got to feel like a huge gut punch. Mm-hmm. So you better find some better players and play better, so that you don't have to get stuck yeah. with the fifth or sixth pick again, even though you might have the worst record. So yeah. you know that's a really long winded way of saying I think what they've done is about as good as you can do. Yeah, you I can just... change it from you know f- four teams get picked in the lottery to now maybe five or six and, and it can be even more crazy. But I also think the team that went, you know, that won 13 games or whatever the, you know, whatever the worst record each year ends up being yeah. shouldn't get the seventh pick. Yeah. You know, they shouldn't get the 13th pick. Like if you just did like every team that didn't make the playoffs is in the lottery, then you, you might end up with a team that won 12 games getting the, the, the 14th pick. That's not right. 
you know, I, I just think I, I still like the idea of having it be a competition uh, mm -hmm. in some form to get the first pick because yeah, then yeah. you get that excitement of like winning a game or you know, some sort of, uh, you know, I mean, maybe it's just one team out of the, out of the bunch that gets right. that opportunity. I don't know. Um, but you know what, you know what they, could, they could do is – because one of the things they should do is they should cut the league down, the, the season down from 82 to like 70. Mm, okay, yeah. One of the things switching that, to that topic because that's another topic that's related. We'll, we'll, we'll shift into that next. All right, yeah. Because um, I know you want to keep teasing your, your timeouts <laughs> thing. But, um, but one of the things I think too with that is if you were cut down to 70, you'd have some opportunities for some type of play-in games. Mm -hmm. And – one thing you could do instead of a draft lottery altogether, like don't even have a draft lottery, but the four worst teams mm -hmm. play a one, you know, a you one go. versus four and a two versus three. I like it. Tournament where you play, play, you know, you the winners of those games play each other, and then the winners of those games play, and the losers play, yeah. and that determines the number one pick, the number two pick, the number three pick, the number. Adam four Silver, pick. make that one happen. That one's so a good idea. I had that, again. This is another one I just thought of as we were talking, but. That to me would be a way of doing what you're saying, where you create some competitiveness. Because yeah. the regular season games, even though there's plenty of them, the regular season is a whole different animal. Like if, especially if if you because if you, to do what your point is, which is how you finish in the, at the end of the season, you know determines how, how it happens. Well, the schedules are all different, right? Mm, right. You, True. if I have to play a Warriors team that's clinched True. home court throughout <laughs> and plays nobody. Yeah, and you have to play the Utah Jazz, who are trying to get the four seed. Yeah, that's not fair to you. Yeah, yeah. yeah and I'm yeah. playing a team that doesn't even care about the win. Like yeah. that shouldn't like that last game then shouldn't determine anything. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's already determined enough because the Jazz are trying to get home court. You know, is this yeah. made up example. So you, so you have a little uh, postseason for the non playoff teams. But right. Not all of them. Right. Right. Exactly. And you know, in a, in one way, it's like well, who would watch that? They're the four worst teams. But it gives them some. It, it, there's a there's a there's some motivation there. Yeah. And again, it goes back to my initial comment about you're telling you're telling a guy go go win for us so that we can replace yeah. you, Zion Williamson. Yeah. So there is something to that. And but also, I also think that if let's say let's say like Devin Booker then has two games where he scores fifty yeah. in in that little round robin, right? Yeah. It gives him a chance on a national scale. With how many Suns games are nationally televised right now in the NBA, right? So. Those games would be nationally televised um, because why wouldn't they, right? And then this, and then let's say Devin Booker has two great games that helps him as a player, right? And then if he, if him and and, and uh, DeAndre Ayton play really well and the Suns win the first pick, then now they know they can go with Zion. That builds that nucleus. It's like there, there is, there is something that is pretty awesome to that. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. Of course, now teams are going to tank. To, from the fifth worst to try to get to the fourth worst to get in so that they tournament. Get in that tournament. <laughs> There's no way around it, but I like the idea. Meanwhile, well, you know, the Warriors um, didn't say it out loud, but we're obviously trying to tank um, the year that they got Harrison Barnes mm -hmm. because they were going to lose that pick mm -hmm. if they right. didn't get if it wasn't like top seven and they finished with the, one of the seven worst records, <laughs> um, and. And so they were, and you know, Mark Jackson lied through his teeth and was like, "Oh, you know, we're just playing our young guys. We think they, think they need development." It's like, no, you're not playing your veterans because you don't want to win. Mm -hmm. You know, stop pretending you're, you're trying to win because you're trying to tank. And it worked out. They got Harrison Barnes, and they also drafted, you know, Festus Azili, and then this guy named Draymond who's played a little bit. Yeah, yeah. He's and okay. uh, but they wouldn't have had the seventh pick, and they wouldn't have gotten Harrison Barnes had they not done that. So, mm -hmm. you know, you know, even in Major League Baseball right now. It's like, the, you know, our favorite team, the San Francisco Giants, them losing right now stinks. They've been losing for three years. But the last two years, they've drafted Joey Bart, who could be one of the best catchers in a generation, possibly. Um, they just drafted Hunter Bishop out of Arizona State, who's, you know, could be a, a great power hitting left fielder. And if they're terrible again, like they have been this year, then they're going to be – more likely be a top 10 have a top 10 draft pick next year in a much more loaded draft mm -hmm. and suddenly these back to back to back years of of uh drafting you know much higher will help the giants retool yeah i'll and be so rooting they, for them to lose again later tonight well exactly and so do you root for your favorite team to lose so they can get those draft picks because 
if no matter what Giants fans were doing you know, a decade ago, the Giants being terrible for four years helped them get Lincecum and helped them get Bumgarner and helped them get Posey. Mm-hmm. And then they got Zach Wheeler, who could have you know been a fourth guy. But that four-year run, they drafted four guys who not only made the major leagues, but have all made big impacks mm-hmm. over the time. And even Wheeler is still in the, in the major leagues. So though, but those just those three years, you know, Lincecum, Bumgarner, and Posey, it's like, oh, my God, that those the three of the best Giants of all time. And it's because they were terrible the three previous years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, you know, to go back to the NBA, it's like the Warriors drafting Steph Curry and Klay Thompson and then getting Draymond Green in the 2012 draft. Those four years in those three drafts changed the Warriors forever. Now, none of those were number one picks. And they – in a lot of ways got lucky that some of those players fell to them and that other teams didn't think they as highly of those players. And they happened to hit on all three of them, which is crazy because that doesn't usually happen that, that many times in a row. Um, but they were, they were able to, to change their the whole course of their, their franchise because of those drafts. And so as much as tanking sucks and you never want your team to want to lose, there is some strategy to that that does help long-term because, you know, you look at a team like the Charlotte Hornets who every year they tend to win 30 something games and every year they get like a 14th or 15th pick every year. They kind of get the eight seed and, and right now they've got, you know, maybe they bring back Kemba Walker on a super max. And if they don't, they have all these players who aren't really that good anymore, but are all making starter money. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you're going to, you're going to win games with Marvin Williams and Nicholas Batum and, you know, and Michael K. Gilchrist and all these guys that look like they could be really good players and they just cat really never made it beyond their plateaus. Mm-hmm. And it's like, so if Charlotte completely tanked next year and got the number, you know, got a top three pick, that could actually be better for them long term. Now it would stink for that one year, but that actually might be what they should do. And instead, what they'll probably do is give Kemba Walker a Supermax and then have. Nothing. They're not. They're still going to win thirty six. Are you t- trying to tell Michael Jordan how to do his job? Well, I, I do think that Michael Jordan doesn't do a very good job as a general manager. But then you heard it here first. But well, I, I guarantee you, you heard it <laughs> first. But um, but you know, that I mean, Magic Johnson was a terrible GM. Derek Jeter is proving to be a terrible GM. I mean, so that there, you know, being an extraordinarily gifted, incredible athlete who's one of the greatest to ever do it in your sport does not mean you have a good job. You can be a good general manager. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll, I promise you after saying all that, just cause I'm saying that about the Charlotte Hornets in that moment does not mean that I knew what they should have done. <laughs> and I actually liked Michael Kidd, Gilchrist and Nick yeah. Batum as players and thought both their, def- both of them defensively specifically were perfect fits of the Warriors and wish they could have found ways to get, <laughs> get them in previous years. So don't suggest that just because I'm saying that, that I'm saying it was some kind of like, forethought that I knew the Hornets would be terrible. Yeah. Oh, well. Next next topic. Are you ready? Let's do it. Well, I mean, the one that we alluded to for a minute there was um, uh, was the uh, schedule. You, you talked about reducing the schedule to 70 games, which I feel mm-hmm. like, I don't know, like uh, that's a big money down the drain kind of plan for the NBA to lose games off the regular season, which I feel like may be unrealistic. However, we've got these players that are sitting out and resting right. games. Uh, load management. Load management, uh, which is not a terrible thing in the grand s- scheme of the NBA. But if you're a fan and you're in Sacramento and you're like, all right, this is my time of the year to see, like, uh, I don't know, um, Giannis of the Bucks. It's the one game he's coming to town, and then now he's sitting out because of rest. Then that defeats the purpose in some sense of the money thing because you're not going to want to go anymore. Because uh, you can't see him, so right. so there's a problem in terms of um, uh, bringing fans out, fan interest, um, mm-hmm. uh, in terms of uh, teams resting players. Um, so uh, we could try to reduce the schedule. I think that makes perfect sense from an NBA player perspective, from an NBA coach perspective, but not from a business perspective necessarily. So maybe we lengthen out the season. They've already done that a little bit. I think they've encroached on preseason. Preseason, I think, is a little bit shorter yeah. now. Which I think also hurt the initial couple of weeks of the NBA season because guys weren't really ready. But yeah. it's also the it's also the first time they did it. So then we could we could we could do that more. We could extend it. we could have the regular season start in September or something. Yeah. 
Um, I don't necessarily I think have a solution you, for this either. I think you cut it to 70, and you just pay players more per game. You know, you don't change their salaries. But then you the know. revenue from the games, you know, that's like six well, less so, home so games. It's, it's six, you lose six home games, but you still get 35. And how many tickets do you sell when Giannis is healthy? And mm-hmm. how many tickets do you sell when there's load management, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, the amount of money a, a team can make on ticket sales because the Warriors are coming into town and they're healthy and they're all playing mm-hmm. versus when it's a back-to-back and you know they're going to rest one of the games. To me, what you do is you cut it to seventy. You don't change. You don't change the day at the start of the season or the end, and you get rid of all back to backs. Mm-hmm. So I think they're they're down now to about twelve or thirteen back to backs mm-hmm. for most teams now, mm-hmm. and that's and they've they've trimmed that down. Yeah. So what you do is you take away twelve games, and you also take away all twelve back to backs. Yeah. So now when they come into Sacramento, they're going to get a full day's rest at least before they go to to Oakland and, or San Francisco, and before they go to. LA for the Clippers or the Lakers. Yeah. And because they're not going to play Friday and Saturday, then you don't technically ever need to rest a guy just for rest. Because if you're never having four games in five nights, if you're never having back-to-backs anymore, then only playing three games a week, you'll be fine. Mm-hmm. You know, And even if you play four games a week, there's going to be at least a day off in between. And so um, if it goes to only the only time you ever play four games – you know, in a week is when you play over seven days instead of five, and you never have any more back-to-backs, then that that will fix the, those 70 games will be more exciting. Mm-hmm. Technically, you'll also be – it'll be more interesting because you have 12 less games to get to get to the playoffs, 12 less right. games to, to figure it out. You know, the Philadelphia 76ers this year, with all the big trades they made, you know, would have had 12 less games to get to know each other, and that would have been even more – chaos but mm-hmm. at the same time it's like it would have created even more drama you know so there, yeah. to me the only negative it, and you brought it up already is the revenue mm-hmm. lost by the teams mm-hmm. and players you know will, will always make comments like well I don't want to give up 12 game checks and to mm-hmm. me it's like no but your contract is over five years like you just will just divide differently yeah, you yeah, know it's yeah, not, yeah, yeah. now you're having now you have 70 game checks instead of 82 yeah you know? Um, and to me, it's like cutting that 12 will also allow for the playoffs maybe – even if you have the, the same date, like the playoffs could maybe be more competitive as well because you're sure. less likely to have injured guys going into the, the postseason as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I'm just trying to – like I completely agree with you. I'm just trying to make this um, more feasible for Adam Silver who's watching right now to say, okay, I'm going to lose 12 games off the calendar for every team. So I'm every team's losing six home games. Multiply that by however many, how much money you make per game. Okay, I'm losing X amount of money, so I need to win that back by, I don't know, like that. That's that's where I'm stuck. But besides that, from a fan perspective, I think I agree with you. From a coach and player perspective, it makes a lot of sense. Um, well, you're, you're going to get the additional revenue from the uh, from the, the toilet bowl before teams. Oh, there you go. The toilet bowl. I like that. Yes. Yeah. Um, I was imagining. You know, like the other thing. Room reference or some kind. The other thing I was going to bring up. The toilet bowl. Real like quickly it. is um, that I just remembered is that Adam Silver had kind of alluded to having more of a um, pro pro soccer um, kind of atmosphere with with, with mm. uh, basketball where um, you have like almost like a like se- like secondary um, tournaments. Mm. Um, you know, after the mm. season and, and having more yeah. opportunities for like more champions and stuff like sure. that. But one of the things that would be interesting, like the toilet bowl, right? But one of the things that would be more inter- would be interesting along those lines is the teams that are the worst would then maybe go down to the G League mm. because you know, like something <laughs> yeah. like that, where yeah, yeah, yeah. you have to be you, like as far as the anti taking too. Is it like there's only like, maybe you make it to where by twenty twenty four. There's only going to be 28 teams mm, yeah. in the NBA. Yeah, yeah. So two teams will always get knocked down to the G League for yeah. for a year, and that would also help to build the G League because yeah. teams would then be like, man, we have, we can go from being the Santa Cruz Warriors to being in the NBA. Yeah. You know, so we better really build our team up and you know yeah, look yeah. for you know other ways. That's not a bad to, idea. So it would be super extreme right now because of how low level. Yeah. Um, talent wise the G League is compared to the NBA but think about some of the 
incredible stories in soccer in the last few years where teams have come from like really low levels and suddenly been in like the top leagues and won. Mm -hmm. And then like how improbable yeah. those things are. It's like, so if Sioux Falls suddenly has a team that makes the NBA playoffs because they jumped, they, they found talent, you know, where we didn't know there was and mm -hmm. they found some superstar no one knew about and suddenly that guy's scoring 30 a night in the NBA, yeah. you know, and, um, you know, the unlike there's a super unlikely, but it also would be all the more reason for the Suns to get their act together and for, yeah. you know, our, my old warriors and your old Kings to get their act together in, yeah. in past years yeah. is if, you know, two teams were told, nope, sorry, you're no longer in the yeah. NBA until you have a, you know, a year from now you can win the G league and come up. But yeah, you know, the two teams that made the play for the G league championship um, are automatically guaranteed to be in the NBA the next year. Like how insane is that? Yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, you had mentioned um, the All-Star game uh, and how you hate it. Well, you know, I, I don't hate it as much as some, but many, many people hate almost every All-Star game at this point, right? Like, <laughs> I don't think there's a single All-Star game that doesn't have fans slander. I think I think kids but, like All-Star games more than adults, in my experience. I think, I, think adults, but, I think adults have this longing for the past – and All-Star Games is one of those moments where mm. it kind of really comes up because, you know, the, the, the Midsummer Classic, you know, the All-Star Game in baseball was always, you know, Willie Mays played the whole game. And, you, know, mm -hmm. you know, Pete Rose, you know, brutally destroying Ray Fossey at the home plate was somehow, you know, cool. You well, know, and in was, basketball, there was that memorable game where uh, – Magic Johnson came out of retirement and right. like scored a bunch of points. And but you know, and the, you know, the funny thing about that too, to bring that one up specifically, is that to me that is exactly what the All Star Game is supposed to be about, mm -hmm. which is similar to like when Dwayne Wade and Dirk Nowitzki, you know, played mm -hmm. this year. Mm -hmm. Is Magic Johnson shouldn't have played in that game if mm -hmm. it was based on that season, mm -hmm. but he played in that game because he meant so much to the sport. Mm -hmm. And then him getting a bunch of jumpers off and they all went in. It wasn't like he was getting defended strongly. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. there was a defender, but it was like it was an all-star game. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, Cal Ripken getting a chance to play in his last season, even though Cal Ripken shouldn't have been in there based on his numbers that year, and then hitting a home run in that game. It's like, yeah, you'll, you're going to remember that more than, you know, Hank Blaylock winning the MVP one year because he happened to be a decent third baseman for half a season. Yeah. Like, I'm yeah. sorry, but – you know, all star games should be about stars, mm -hmm. and there's a, there's a lot of things to how we can build stars more. Mm -hmm. But you know, yeah, I would want to see Mike Trout play nine innings. I would want to see Steph Curry play thirty minutes in an all star game. Yeah. But also, is that really smart if he gets hurt in that game or whatever? It's like it should be treated as an exhibition on all levels. Well, too, and too yet quick. people are like, you shouldn't even have it. And so, you know, should we? Two quick ideas for you. One is to reduce the size of the roster for basketball. Just have eight guys on a team, maybe okay. ten. Uh, that way the guys have to play more minutes. But then again, they are afraid of getting hurt, potentially, or their contract, uh, their agents are definitely well, <laughs> afraid. I, I, think their agents I, would, I think their agents would rather their, their client make the all-star team than how many, yeah. And how many minutes they play? Yeah, right? I mean, yeah. You know, what I mean, like it, the fact that, and, the, and honestly, the fact that Dirk Nowitzki and Dwayne Wade made the All Star team this year, yeah. when they put down all their stats for their Hall of Fame inductions, whatever, right. Right. it's going to have an additional All Star game for both of them, yeah. even though they had no business playing in the All Star game based yeah. on their numbers. Yeah. And what's wrong with that? You know, I, I think you know, when you look at it, it's like if you expanded the roster from twelve to fifteen, it would dilute. How many guys, you know, make the playoff or make the All Star team, and it would make it less valuable. Mm -hmm. But those thirty players would then be able to say, "I was one of the thirty best that year," and that's going to help me in my next contract. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's a single player that wouldn't wouldn't mind it be expanding. Yeah. If you do cut it down, yes, good guys would have to play more. But then I would almost say, if you cut it down, then don't have the game. Mm -hmm. Have it be just the top sixteen players, like you're saying. Mm -hmm. But then don't play the game. Just give them the honor. Mm -hmm. You know because. Yeah. Giving guys – stopping the all-star um, balloting or changing the balloting, those things can be talked about too. But if you don't have all-stars and you suddenly just stop it altogether, mm -hmm. you know, they still have all-NBA, which mm -hmm. matters. Mm -hmm. um, and that actually looks – people look at that more than all-star games usually. How many all-NBAs does some, right. some guy have? Right. Um, but at the same time, I think it's like if you don't have all-star games, and that's actually one way to 
to navigate who are the best players that year and not that you don't have, mm-hmm. you know? And so, yeah. the um, other, um, the other idea I had, you should was, still have the all-star voting in some fashion, whether it's fans or whatever, yeah. even if you don't have the game. anymore. I mean, I, so what baseball did was they, they increased the incentive a little bit, right? There was like a money prize, mm-hmm. I think that they added this year, if I'm not mistaken, or last year. Well, I know that they had the, you know, Home or home field, home field for a while. Which is so stupid. That was dumb. I think that what they did was they removed that, but then they put in the the, there's like just a a cash prize for the winner or something like that. I don't know if the the players voted on that. I I would say maybe. Did the NBA do that too though? Because it wasn't. I thought there was some more incentive for you. Well, I would. That's my next question is because if if there's not, then maybe we ask the players. A million dollars to each player's you know favorite charity. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what. I like that. What would be my solution would be whatever the players, whatever will cause the players to play defense and <laughs> like actually play the game. I do think the yeah. last two years, we've seen way more defense the last mm. two years than we have in the last decade mm. because they got to pick their own teams. Yeah. yeah. I think picking their own teams actually really worked out because guys might have felt slighted because they didn't get picked by someone's guys yeah. felt like, Oh, this is our team. So we, we, we created this team. So mm-hmm. we better do well with this team. And, mm-hmm. um, and you could definitely see the last two years because LeBron's teams won both years. And, you know, he clear, those guys clearly rallied around each other and, and tried mm-hmm. to win the game at the end. So there was definitely some more competition compared to previous years. So yeah. that helped. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. 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 So something along those lines, I think, as long as the players are playing a little bit of defense, I'm in favor of keeping the game because it is, it is the best players in the world. Right. Even if they're not completely, you know, serious the whole time, it's 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 still and it's you know, an exhibition game. So they should they should be having fun. Yeah. Exactly. They, they don't. They shouldn't be serious the whole time. All right. Uh, so should we finally uh, should we finish up on this one uh, uh, idea for timeouts at the end of the game? Yeah. Let's go. Okay. I'm ready. <clears throat> All right, so uh, actually, this is not my idea, but it's it's one that I was talking as, to my friend. As you wrote it. I'll, I, I'll take credit for it. Well, <laughs> it's going in the podcast. Okay. Um, so I, I was going to look it up, but I didn't. It, it's been used uh, in, I think, so there's that uh, tournament called the Basketball Tournament. The Basketball Tournament. It's like a, I think Jason Williams and Mike Bibby played last year. It's some of these okay. recently yeah, 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 yeah. I remember. I remember that. Um, anyway, so they've been, it's, it's one of these tester kind of leagues, I think, where they, you know, goof around with the rules a little bit so uh I, if it was not that league i apologize uh, but what they what they did was um uh with a certain amount of time left in the game let's say five minutes left in the game you just go and add some amount of points let's say plus 10 or plus 20 and so if the score is let's say 98 to 95 then you're just playing to 118 and that's it okay and, and there's yeah, yeah. no clock anymore you i mean there's a shot clock but there's no game clock and if it, of course, if it ends at 118 all, then you know, some or something like that, then I guess that that might be possible. But anyway, either way, you're playing to a certain um, score, and so then. Well, actually, if you're playing to 100, I was saying it there wouldn't be, be possible. No, there would be Somebody no has to get there first, right? Somebody would have to get there first. Yes, yeah, so let's go with that. So anyway, uh, I haven't fleshed this out completely, but. Anyway, so if you're playing 118, like, I, I, you, you know math better than I do, but I'm pretty yeah. sure it's not possible for for teams to get to 118 at the same time. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> anyway, so so the whole idea when you're down by six with 40 seconds left is you got to foul, and the other team shoots free. Right, right, right. And then you got to take timeouts, and I mean you can so still. There's take, a lot more strategy when there's time left. You can still take timeouts in this in this case, so it's not necessarily specifically a solution for reducing the number of stoppages that way, but it's certainly a. a a strategy for reducing the number of, of the stoppages by foul. Because if you're fouling, then it, it stops the clock. But in this right. scenario, if you're just playing to a number, there's no clock, there's no point in fouling. And so the, the, the game keeps going, at least in, in, the, in the foul department. Um, and then teams are, like, if it's 117 all, right, then teams are charting plays. They're not necessarily right. running the clock down. They're not worried about the clock. They're just trying to score the best they can. The other right, team's right. just trying to play defense the best they can. And fouls are not a factor. Uh, any more than they are in the second quarter. Um, so it would take some refining, I think, as far as like how many minutes left in the fourth quarter before you pull the plug and just play to a certain number, how many points are I do like that given. idea because we were talking about that similarly, right? With maybe was it college basketball we were talking about that? I can't Something remember. Something like that, yeah. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I like that idea of like once you get to a certain point, then it's like, okay, now it's the, you know, 
if, if the team that's winning has to score 20 more points. Did, did I spoil this idea in the college basketball podcast? I, I, just, I remember you talking about the idea of like once – once you got to a certain point, then it was like, okay, now there's only this many points left. Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. Um, I remember we talked about That's that. That's okay. Nobody saw that podcast. Anyway. <laughs> Just kidding. Now I, no, I'm joking the other way. Now everyone's watching our podcast, right? That's absolutely. Anyway, so I think something like that would help. Uh, it wouldn't like teams could still call timeouts, but. Uh, it would certainly speed things up at the end and make it just more of a basketball contest is, yeah. instead of a uh, foul shooting contest. So, Sounds good. Anyway. All right. Well, wait. We fixed basketball. Yeah. It's so, all done. Thank you for joining us. Appreciate you guys taking the time out of your busy day to check out our podcast. We'll come back in a few weeks with the next sport to fix. In the meantime. It will be auto racing. Auto racing. It will, not be, it will not be auto racing. <laughs> um, but, yeah. Hope you had fun, and we'll see you next time.